Nothing says new beginnings quite like the start of a new year. We throw around sayings like, new year, new me. We're motivated to take on new healthy habits like exercising and eating right. January marks a fresh start. And as you'll see, it's kind of always been that way. You see, some of history's greatest new beginnings took place in this month of January. Most of these stories started with nothing more than an idea and a bit of hope. But it took a lot more than that to get these new beginnings into the timeline of history. Perseverance, determination, and commitment to what many would have called crazy aspirations. These traits forged these ideas into powerful tools that brought hope to people around the world. That's what's happening this month in Christian history. On January 1st, 1862, one of the most historic executive orders ever passed by a president went into effect, the Emancipation Proclamation. Issued by President Abraham Lincoln in September of the preceding year, this proclamation brought the United States one step closer to embodying the concept of liberty and justice for all. The proclamation read, On the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Now, when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, it didn't actually free any of the slaves in the states loyal to the Union. Ironically, the document only applied to enslaved people in the Confederacy. In order to be effective and, well, legal, the proclamation had to be presented as a military measure rather than legislation. But it also marked a big shift in Lincoln's publicized views on slavery in the Union. Emancipation would redefine the Civil War. It was originally a struggle between the Union and the rebel states. Unionists wanting to preserve the national identity and states wanting to preserve individual state power. But the Emancipation Proclamation turned the public consciousness from the struggle to preserve the Union and focused it on ending slavery. There were about four million slaves in the nation at that time, and the Emancipation Proclamation had the federal support to change the legal status of more than 3.5 million enslaved African Americans in the Confederacy. If you're wondering how the North could have legal power over slaves in the South, we'll get to that later. If a slave wanted to escape control of the Confederate government, their only hope was to run away across Union lines. Otherwise, they would have to hope freedom would come to them through the military advancement of the Northern Army. Ultimately, it was the Union victory these paths brought together, forcing the Emancipation Proclamation into effect in all of the South. Even though it specifically excluded the non-rebellious southern states, known as border states, the proclamation still applied to more than 85% of the 4 million slaves in the country. Somewhere between 30,000 to 70,000 slaves were immediately emancipated in the regions of the Confederacy where the Union Army was already in place. The Union did not have the legal power to enforce the proclamation in the areas still in rebellion. However, as the Union Army took control of the South, the proclamation gave actual legality for the liberation of the enslaved people. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 said that escaped slaves had to be either returned to their masters or held for eventual return. Less than 100 years after its founding, the United States of America stood divided. Sadly, many slave owners in the South were not happy about the Emancipation Proclamation. As the Union gained support in America, Confederacy turned abroad for aid. But Europeans that would have intervened to help the Confederacy did not want to be viewed as directly in support of slavery. This caused a noticeable halt in foreign aid for the Confederates. Meanwhile, the Emancipation Proclamation gave new hope to African-American slaves. It became an effective motivator, inspiring many to escape from their masters and get to the Union lines as fast as possible. Many obtained their freedom this way and then joined the Union Army to fight for the freedom of those they left behind. The Emancipation Proclamation redefined the Civil War. 
Though the war began as a struggle to preserve the Union, the proclamation transformed the war into a fight to end slavery. In order to ensure that slavery was abolished in all of the U.S., Lincoln insisted that states require abolition in their new laws after the war. Lincoln encouraged border states to adopt abolition and began his famous push for the 13th Amendment. The issue of slavery, like many issues, was originally delegated to the individual states. So for a considerable amount of time, the federal government's power to end slavery was limited by the Constitution. You might be wondering, did our Constitution really say that slavery was okay? Well, that question is what fueled the Civil War. In examining the constitutionality of slavery, it should be noted that the explicit word slavery was not used in the 1787 Constitution. However, there were many references to unfree persons. The Three-Fifths Compromise allocated congressional seats based on the whole number of free persons and three-fifths of all other persons. Under the Fugitive Slave Clause, no person held to service or labor in one state would be freed if they simply escaped to another state. At the same time, many slave owners pushed for the counting of slaves for the sake of congressional seats. These slave owners were, in effect, acknowledging that the slaves they deemed as their property were indeed people entitled to the same freedoms of any citizen of the United States. This duplicity drew attention to the fact that the Confederate states were directly denying God-given rights to life, liberty, and property, which are promised by the Constitution in the Fifth Amendment. Between 1777 and 1804, all but two northern states agreed with the abolition of slavery. This means that half the nation interpreted the Constitution in favor of freedom. But in a historic case called Dred v. Scott, the Supreme Court sided with the Confederate slave owners in their interpretation. With this backdrop, President Lincoln must have known that the emancipation would never pass as legislation. So once the Civil War arrived, he issued the proclamation under his separate duty as Commander-in-Chief under Article II of the Constitution. He claimed to have the power to free persons held as slaves in those states that were still in rebellion, as a, quote, fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion. He did not, however, have commander-in-chief authority over the four slave-holding states that were not in rebellion, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. Because of this, he very purposefully did not include them in the proclamation. Though limited by the Constitution, the proclamation provided the legal framework for the emancipation of nearly all four million slaves as the Union armies advanced. This committed the Union to the mission of ending slavery, which was a controversial decision even in the North. Hearing of the proclamation, more slaves quickly escaped to Union lines while the army units moved south. As Union armies advanced through the Confederacy, thousands of slaves were freed each day until nearly all were freed by the summer of 1865. While the proclamation had freed most slaves as a wartime measure, it didn't make slavery officially illegal. In 1863, President Lincoln proposed a plan for the reconstruction of the captured Confederate state of Louisiana. The state was required to accept the Emancipation Proclamation and officially abolish slavery in its new constitution. The same type of reconstruction plans would also be implemented in Arkansas and Tennessee. Lincoln first discussed the proclamation with his cabinet in July 1862. His audience was speechless. After reading the first draft of his proclamation, Secretary of State William Seward finally spoke up, but not in the way Lincoln had hoped. Seward warned of the document's potential to cause anarchy throughout all of the South. Still, Lincoln persisted, dedicated to fight for freedom. And he found allies within his cabinet, like Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who would one day spearhead the manhunt for his Lincoln's assassin. But that's a story for another day. Here's what you need to know. Late in 1862, Lincoln asked his Attorney General, Edward Bates, for his opinion as to whether slaves freed through a war-related proclamation of emancipation could simply be re-enslaved once the war was over. Bates had to work through the language of the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision to arrive at an answer, but he finally concluded that they could indeed remain free. Still, a complete and decided end to slavery would require an amendment to the Constitution. Conflicting advice to free all slaves or not free them at all was presented to Lincoln in public and private. 
Thomas Nast, a cartoon artist during the Civil War, composed many works, including a two-sided spread that showed the transition from slavery into civilization after President Lincoln signed the proclamation. Nast believed in equal opportunity and equality for all people regardless of race and status. A mass rally in Chicago on September 7, 1862, demanded an immediate and universal emancipation of slaves. A delegation headed by William W. Patton met the president at the White House on September 13th. Lincoln had declared in peacetime that he had no constitutional authority to free the slaves. Even used as a war power, emancipation was a risky political act. Public opinion as a whole was against it. But remember Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Seward? He eventually came around to Lincoln's side. Seward cautiously encouraged Lincoln to issue the proclamation after a major Union victory. And that's exactly what he did. In September 1862, the Battle of Antietam gave Lincoln the victory he needed to issue the emancipation. In the battle, though the Union suffered heavier losses than the Confederates and General McClellan allowed the escape of Robert E. Lee's retreating troops, Union forces turned back a Confederate invasion of Maryland, eliminating more than a quarter of Lee's army in the process. On September 22, 1862, five days after Antietam occurred, and while living at the soldiers' home, Lincoln called his cabinet into session and issued the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. According to Civil War historian James M. McPherson, Lincoln told his cabinet that he had made a covenant with God that if the Union drove the Confederacy out of Maryland, he would issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln had first shown an early draft of the proclamation to Vice President Hannibal Hamlin, an abolitionist, who was more often kept in the dark on presidential decisions. The final proclamation was issued on January 1st, 1863. Although implicitly granted authority by Congress, Lincoln used his powers as commander-in-chief as the basis of his proclamation. Some days after issuing the final proclamation, Lincoln wrote to Major General John McClernand, after the commencement of hostilities, I struggled nearly a year and a half to get along without touching the institution. And when finally I conditionally determined to touch it, I gave a hundred days fair notice of my purpose to all the states and people, within which time they could have turned it wholly aside by simply again becoming good citizens of the United States. They chose to disregard it, and I made the preemptory proclamation on what appeared to me to be a military necessity. And being made it must stand. Initially, the Emancipation Proclamation freed only a small percentage of the slaves, those who were behind Union lines in areas not exempt. Most slaves were still behind Confederate lines or in exempt Union-occupied areas. Secretary of State William H. Seward commented, We show our sympathy with slavery by emancipating slaves where we cannot reach them and holding them in bondage where we can set them free. The proclamation only gave the Lincoln administration the legal basis to free the slaves in the areas of the South that were still in rebellion on January 1st, 1863. It effectively destroyed slavery as the Union armies advanced South and conquered the entire Confederacy. You see, Lincoln faced a whole set of challenging constraints during his war against slavery. The federal government was specifically designed to have little say over the states. The intention of the forefathers and the Constitution was to empower locals to make the laws that closely served their unique way of life, rather than having a distant national government enforcing laws that did not benefit the citizens that they were forced upon. However, slavery was the exception. The Confederate states were directly denying God-given rights to life, liberty, and property, and Lincoln knew that federal intervention was necessary to end it. Ex-slaves contributed significantly to the Union military after the proclamation. Nearly a quarter of a million black slaves enlisted to fight for the North. Their contributions were massively significant and provided the necessary manpower to ensure victory. In a last-ditch effort, the Confederacy allowed slaves to fight in its army during the last months before its defeat. Because the emancipation was a wartime measure, some Americans were concerned the measure would no longer apply once the war was over. To quell these concerns, Lincoln staked a large part of his 1864 presidential campaign on a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery once and for all throughout all the United States. This would be the Constitution's 13th Amendment. But rather than wait for the incoming 39th Congress 
Lincoln pushed the 38th Congress to pass the proposed amendment immediately. It was January 31st, this very month in history back in 1865, when the United States Congress passed the 13th Amendment by the needed two-thirds vote. This took place just about three years after the Emancipation Proclamation first went into effect. The 13th Amendment was ratified by the United States on December 6th, 1865. Finally, with this landmark amendment, slavery and indentured servitude were definitively illegal in the United States. It goes without saying, the 13th Amendment was one of the greatest new beginnings in American history and absolutely fundamental to making America the great nation it is today. The United States is a place where people of every nation, race, language, or belief can come together and experience the freedoms to pursue their dreams. Because of what happened this month in history, we can look around today and see diverse Americans leading in the way of business, entertainment, science, tech, government, and beyond. And there's so much more to come. Though we've had our ups and downs, the United States remains a land of liberty and promise. For centuries, the world's citizens have made their way to America to find new beginnings. In fact, it was in this month, back in 1892, that Ellis Island opened its gates to men, women, and children, ready to plant new roots. These roots have bloomed into over 100 million Americans who can trace their ancestry through Ellis Island. The island is named after its former owner, Samuel Ellis, a colonial New Yorker and merchant. But before him, the Native American name for the island was Kiyoshk, meaning Gull Island, due to its large population of seagulls. Kiyoshk was composed mostly of marshy, brackish lowlands. It is unlikely the Native Americans established any permanent structures on Kiyoshk, since the island would have been completely submerged at high tide. The island was bought in 1630 by the Dutch. The three islands in Upper New York Bay, Liberty, Black Tom, and Ellis Islands, were combined by giving them the name Oyster Islands, due to the large oyster population. Present-day Ellis Island was distinguished from the other Oyster Islands by giving it the name Little Oyster Island. Obviously, creativity wasn't much of a priority in the early process of island naming. By the 1760s, Little Oyster Island became a site for the public execution of pirates, specifically at a tree called the Gibbet Tree. Public executions acted as a warning to citizens of the fate of one who entered into the trade of piracy. Ellis Island was used for official military business for about 80 years. By the 1790s, as a result of the United States' increased military tensions with Britain and France, Congress drew a map of possible locations for major fortifications. The state built forts on Bedloes, Ellis, and Governor's Islands. Batteries and magazines were built on Ellis Island, they were preparing it for war, but a military conflict failed to occur, and by 1805, the fort had become run down. The Ellis family still owned most of the island, and it was suggested to sell off the land to the government. Ultimately, the remaining portion of the island was acquired by condemnation the next year, and it was ceded to the United States in 1808 for $10,000. Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Williams, placed in charge of New York Harbor defenses, proposed several new fortifications around the harbor as part of the second system of fortifications. The new fortifications included many upgrades in firepower. The War Department established a circular stone 14-gun battery, a mortar battery, and barracks. The fort was initially called Crown Fort, but by the end of the War of 1812, the battery was named Fort Gibson in honor of Colonel James Gibson of the 4th Regiment. The fort was not used in combat during the war and instead served as a barracks for the 11th Regiment, as well as a jail for British prisoners of war. Expansions were made during the Civil War, but after the fighting ceased, the fort declined again 
this time to an extent that the weaponry was rendered unusable. Castle Clinton had processed more than 8 million immigrants since 1855, but the federal government noted Castle Clinton as having varied charges of mismanagement, abuse of immigrants, and evasion of the laws, and as such, wanted to be done with it. The federal government took control of immigration in early 1890 and commissioned a study to determine the best place for the new immigration station in New York Harbor. Among members of the United States Congress, there was deliberation on whether to build on Ellis, Governors, or Liberty Island. On April 11, 1890, the federal government ordered the structures at Ellis Island to be torn down and replaced by the U.S.'s first federal immigration station. The Department of the Treasury, which was in charge of constructing federal buildings in the U.S., officially took control of the island. During construction, Ellis Island's land size was almost doubled to six acres. The main structure had two stories and was constructed out of Georgia pine. The station opened January 1, 1892. The first immigrant to pass through the island was Annie Moore, a 17-year-old Irish girl. Along with her two brothers, she was traveling to the States to meet her parents who were already here. Over the next 12 months, 400,000 immigrants would be processed at Ellis Island. The processing procedure included a series of medical and mental inspections, and through this process, about 1% of potential immigrants were rejected and deported. More expansions were added throughout the 1890s, and Ellis Island grew to 14 acres. On June 15, 1897, the wooden structures on Ellis Island were completely consumed in a fire. There were no casualties, but the wooden buildings had completely burned down after two hours, and all immigration records from 1855 had been destroyed. The cause of the fire was unknown. After the fire, the barge office began processing passenger arrivals, which was soon found ill-equipped to handle the influx of immigrants. Plans were made to build a new fireproof immigration station. The Treasury's supervising architect, James Knox Taylor, opened an architecture competition to rebuild the immigration station. The rules of the contest made specific mention of the use of fireproof materials. Additionally, the buildings had to be able to host an average of 1,000 immigrants per day and a maximum of 4,000 per day. There were several prominent architectural firms that filed proposals, but the winners would end up being Edward Lippincott Tilton and William A. Boring. Tilton and Boring's plan called for four new structures, a main building in the French Renaissance style, as well as the kitchen laundry building, powerhouse, and the main hospital building. The plan also included the creation of a new island called Island 2, yet another amazing example of island naming skills in the 1800s. On this Island 2, the hospital would be built just south of the existing island. With the start of a new century and a couple years after commencing construction, the station was opened on December 17, 1900, but without pomp or circumstance. That day, 2,251 immigrants were processed through the building. The building had a job to do, and it did just that. Additional projects were quickly commenced to assist the main structure, including an entrance canopy, baggage conveyor, and railroad ticket office. A ferry house was also built between the islands one and two. The facilities proved barely able to handle the flood of immigrants that arrived, and as early as 1903, immigrants had to remain in their transatlantic boats for several days due to inspection backlogs. Substantial changes to Ellis Island's appearance were made by Immigration Commissioner William Williams. Plants, paths, and landscaping was laid on the formerly barren ground. Under Williams' guidance, a third island was built to accommodate a contagious diseases ward. When deciding upon the name on which to call this third island, William Williams drew upon the naming skills that he obviously inherited from his parents. After what we can only assume were many sleepless nights, William Williams called it Island 3. A crib walk connected the islands on their western side, giving Ellis Island an overall E-shape. Upon the completion of Island 3 in 1906, Ellis Island covered 20 acres. The structures on Black Tom Island were heavily damaged during the Black Tom explosion of 1916. Two million tons of war materials packed into train cars had blown up in the Black Tom Railroad Yard on what is now a part of Liberty State Park. German agents were determined to prevent Americans from supplying munitions to its English enemy during the First World War. 
This act of sabotage was not only one of the largest artificial non-nuclear explosions to have ever occurred, but one of the last provocations that enticed America into joining World War I. During the war, the immigration station was repaired and temporarily closed in order to use the facilities as a jail for suspected enemy combatants and later as a hospital for the wounded soldiers. Immigration nearly came to a standstill with the passing of the Emergency Quota Act of 1921 and the Immigration Act of 1924. Ellis Island was effectively changed into an immigrant detention center, the final stop before deportation. Immigration slowed even more after the stock market crash of 1929. Immigrants were apparently less attracted to a country in the midst of a Great Depression. Operation expenses for the small detention center were fairly large, and by 1947, shortly after the end of World War II, there were proposals to close Ellis Island. By the early 1950s, there were only about 40 detainees left on the island. Ellis Island officially closed on November 12, 1954, with the departure of its last detainee, a Norwegian merchant seaman by the name of Arne Peterson. In 1970, some restoration efforts were beginning, mainly focusing on the landscaping, seawalls, and ferry dock. The Restore Ellis Island Committee was launched to raise awareness and funding for repairs. The north side of the island, with the main building, was rehabilitated and partially reopened for public tours in May of 1976. By 1990, the main building officially became a museum. The museum contains several exhibits across three floors. The first floor features the Family Immigration History Center, Peopling of America, and New Eras of Immigration exhibits. The second floor has the Through America's Gate exhibit and Peak Immigration Years. The third floor contains a dormitory room, Silent Voices exhibit, Treasures from Home, and the Ellis Island Chronicles. There are also three theaters used for film and live performances. The third floor contains a library, reading room, and oral history center. There are auditoriums on all floors, and on the ground floor is a gift shop and bookstore, as well as a booth for audio tours. In 2008, despite opposition from the NPS, the museum's library was officially renamed the Bob Hope Memorial Library. This was in honor of one of the station's most famous immigrants. Bob Hope. On the first day of its opening, 600 immigrants were admitted through Ellis Island. Over the next year, over 400,000 passed through this port of entry. From 1892 to 1924, approximately 12 million immigrants arriving at the Port of New York and New Jersey were processed through Ellis Island. It's estimated that about 40% of all current U.S. citizens can trace at least one of their ancestors to Ellis Island, which is positioned at the mouth of the Hudson River in New York. Occupying only three acres at one point in history, Ellis Island grew to encompass 27 acres of land, but its small footprint had major impact on the country. We wouldn't be the great melting pot we are today without Ellis Island. If you were to visit the island right now, you would find yourself at the northern side of the Statue of Liberty National Monument. The southern island hosts the most famous New Yorker, the Statue of Liberty on Liberty Island. The base of the Statue of Liberty bears a quote emblematic of the American spirit that led to the founding of Ellis Island. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Emma Lazarus. As America opened its golden door to new beginnings, Christians in the United States saw golden opportunity. As the foreign missions movement was gaining momentum, churches, denominations, and Christian organizations saw a new mission field emerging on the home front. While they were sending missionaries out into the world, multitudes of men, women, and children were on their way to them. America's ports of entry became prime land for planting seeds of the gospel. Missionaries went to work in Boston, Philadelphia, and of course, Ellis Island. The mission movement in America's ports of entry became so prevalent that its own periodical was circulated, uniting many Protestant denominations and organizations in the work of welcoming new immigrants. In the Ports of Entry Missionary Herald, one minister writes, No part of the immigrant welcome service is more important than that which is done by the missionaries. Their purpose is primarily to carry the gospel story of salvation and good cheer. Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy 
is the message of the Ports of Entry missionary. This work, however, combines regard for spiritual life and material welfare. It must be humanitarian and philanthropic service of a very practical sort. It is the cup of water in his name, given with the personal touch of one of his disciples. With this philosophy in mind, Christian missionaries rallied to provide clothing, food, shelter, education, and even health care to the incoming citizens being held at Ellis Island. One of the longest residing missionaries, Jenny F. Pratt, ran a school for children, finding innovative ways to bridge language barriers, instructing both students and parents alike in everything from reading and arithmetic to basic hygiene. Sometimes her kindergarten classroom would be filled with 200 students in one day. But she was relentlessly committed to her mission. And after three decades of missionary service at Ellis Island, Jenny F. Pratt retired with the moniker Mrs. Liberty of Ellis Island. As citizens of so-called enemy nations at the time found their way to America's shores, missionaries like Mrs. Pratt saw the opportunity to embrace the humanity and God-given value of each individual. The processing procedure at Ellis Island took time, and through its process, about 2% of potential immigrants were rejected and deported. The waiting was difficult for families, and many of the missionary efforts were devoted to comforting and encouraging immigrants on the cusp of their new beginnings. The New York Bible Society provided Bibles in 86 languages at Ellis Island so that individuals from virtually any nation could find access to the comfort of Scripture in their native tongue. They distributed hundreds of thousands of Bibles and tracts each year, and they were not alone in their work. They were joined by over 30 other national organizations and agencies, including the YMCA, YWCA, the Salvation Army, and missionary agencies from virtually every Christian denomination. The impact Ellis Island had on the missions movement in the United States is truly remarkable. It's no accident Ellis Island has been nicknamed the Isle of Hope. The church came together in innovative ways to embrace the new mission field ripening on our nation's shores. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in John 4.35. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are already ripe for harvest. Thankfully, the church at the time took those words to heart. One thing history can teach us is the hazard of being set in our ways. If we aren't willing to see into the future, we might just overlook the start of something new, even if it's right in front of us. That's what happened to the senior pastor at Calvary Episcopal Church this month in Christian history on January 2nd, 1921. An evening prayer service at Calvary Episcopal Church was underway, but this service wasn't a typical church gathering, at least not for the era. This would be the first radio broadcast of a religious program in the history of radio. And the senior pastor couldn't care less. He actually asked his junior pastor, Reverend Whitmore, to lead the service. Little did he know, this groundbreaking broadcast was carving a path into a multi-billion dollar industry. Once considered a silly experiment, radios would become one of the greatest communication tools in history. But before any of this was possible, radio usage would need to evolve from an amateur science experiment into a commercially viable product. And as with the introduction of any new technology, there were some hurdles to overcome. On the night of KDKA's first broadcast on January 2nd, 1921 at Calvary Episcopal Church, senior pastor Edwin Van Etten was showing standard reservations about the new medium. His church was fitted with equipment the technicians in charge of production were outfitted with choir robes in order to keep them from distracting the congregation with their borderline sacrilegious activities. And to top it all off, they weren't even Christian. Due to the amount of wires and tubes placed around the auditorium, one of the pastors asked if they were positive nothing would blow up. That's why Reverend Van Etten offered up his junior pastor to lead the service. But to his great surprise, it was a big success. According to a Gazette Times article, people were able to hear the broadcast over a radius of 700 miles, and they had heard the music perfectly. The music included carols from various lands, including Russia, Italy, 
Bohemia and England. Among them, Jesu Bambino, The Angels and the Shepherds, and We Three Kings. After the success of the broadcast, the radio station KDKA soon began to offer regular Sunday evening services from Calvary Episcopal Church. The senior pastor, Reverend Edwin Van Etten, overcame his skepticism and became a regular speaker on the broadcast. I love that story. It reminds me of Isaiah 41. God says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making my way into the wilderness and the streams in the desert. Sometimes God's orchestrating something so new, we can't even imagine it. He's trying to show us something new, something groundbreaking, maybe even something we never knew existed, like radio waves. You know, it's hard to imagine, but there was a time when we didn't know radio waves existed. Way before you were flipping through the top 40 hits on the highway, before the Beatles were blasting through speakers around the world, even before families were gathering around listening to Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, radio waves were just a theory. The existence of radio waves was a wild idea held by a Christian physicist named James Clerk Maxwell. His studies of light led him to the electromagnetic theory and in 1865, he proved that radio waves were indeed possible. James Clerk Maxwell's hypothesis led to a discovery by a German scientist that proved his theory true. Radio waves did exist, and they could be used to transmit information. Near the end of his life, Maxwell wrote this about his legacy. The only desire which I can have is like David, to serve my own generation by the will of God and then fall asleep. On what would have been Maxwell's 100th birthday, Albert Einstein described the late scientist's work as the most profound and the most fruitful that physics has experienced since the time of Newton. <laughs> I'd say that served his generation pretty well. Maxwell was a firm believer in the truth of scripture. In his writings, he warns of trying to use science to interpret the Bible. Though science often supports the truth of scripture, science is ever changing while the word of God stands forever. I imagine Maxwell would have been pretty pleased to know that just about 25 years after his death, a passage from the Gospel of Luke would become the first words transmitted over radio. A Canadian inventor by the name of Reginald Fessenden was experimenting with this bold new way to transmit voice and music. Hard to believe, but in 1906, it still hadn't been done. Reginald was a brilliant college professor and a former employee of Thomas Edison, so he was a technology expert in his day. And on a cold December night on Christmas Eve in 1906, Reginald spoke into a microphone, hoping, but not knowing, if anyone would hear him. This young inventor said, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That's right, he read the Christmas story right from the Gospel of Luke. Of course, he didn't know if he was reaching a thousand people or none at all, but he read the words like the entire world was his audience. As it turns out, there were people listening. Wireless radio operators, the kind in military ships and newspaper offices, were shocked at the sounds coming through their speakers. A human voice. Reginald surprised an audience with good news that would cause great joy for all people. Jesus, God's own son, the Prince of Peace, the Savior of the world, was born in a manger in Bethlehem. And to end his historical broadcast, Reginald picked up his violin and played a Christmas carol. O Holy Night became the first song ever broadcast over radio waves. But it would still be a while before radios would make it into homes all around the world. Amateurs were the primary operators of the mostly experimental radio stations after World War I. The military had many restrictions on the medium. But at the conclusion of fighting, many of these restrictions were relaxed. The radio stations were far from sophisticated. Most of them were built with items from around the home of the engineers. It was mostly a hobby, as the range of the stations were very low, and the receivers, the method of hearing the radio, were only operated by other hobbyists. A demand quickly grew, though, as many people wanted to be able to listen to music magically over the air, but they also required a receiver that was easy to operate. 
a receiver that a non-engineer could easily use. The network effect soon took hold and the number of listeners began to stimulate the need for more radio stations. The Harding-Cox presidential election was the first commercial broadcast by a commercial radio station, the Station of Honor, being KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The event took place on November 2nd, 1920. By the end of 1921, and to set off the Roaring Twenties, there were a total of eight radio stations operated in the United States. The financial model back then was similar to how it would remain for several decades. There were two main revenue streams for radio broadcasting, the sale of radio receivers themselves and the sale of advertising. As experimental as radio advertising was back in the early 20s, the medium would be proven sound to the tune of trillions of dollars over the course of the century. Following the First World War, Westinghouse Electric was looking to expand its commercial operations in the radio industry. The military had been the primary customer of Westinghouse's radio transmitters, and they were looking to diversify. This would lead to the development of KDKA, the radio station that would go on to broadcast the first church service. Around the time of KDKA's first religious broadcast, there were other ministers beginning to see the potential for radio to fast-track the spreading of the gospel. In Chicago, Paul Rader, pastor of the Chicago Gospel Tabernacle, decided to partner with a local station and try his hand at radio. It was the summer of 1922, and he convinced a brass quartet to join him on the rooftop of City Hall. He preached a sermon in a makeshift studio and broadcast it through the city. Rader's guest appearance on the local WHT station was a hit. Following the success of his rooftop experiment, Rader struck a deal with a station called WBBM to broadcast 14 hours of religious programming every Sunday, where Jesus Blesses Thousands became the name of Rader's once a week radio show. He shared Sunday evening worship services, choir performances, concerts, and more. He even expanded into biblical dramas and other innovative program formats. One of the hymns Rader wrote for radio became a favorite of Elvis Presley. Elvis actually recorded the song, Only Believe, and put it on his own album. But it was Raider's preaching of the gospel that listeners responded to the most. And as a result, his church grew. Look at that mob. There they come. Get out of the way. Look, they're dragging a woman. They're coming in here. All right, put her right there. There she is. And look at those 10 men coming along with her. 10 great, hard, cold men each with a rock in his hand, lined up around here now, and there, sitting, who's that? The Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. What a picture. A woman taken in adultery. A woman guilty before the law. And here are the ten laws of Moses, and each one of them got a rock. The soul that sinneth it shall die, says the law. And this woman is guilty, taken in the act. Here she is before her accusers and before those who are going to carry out the edict. The law says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And she's here to die. It can't, it can't do anything else. How can the law help? All the law says is thou shalt not, thou art guilty. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Poor woman ashamed, cowering there, tears have covered her cheeks, her hair's loosened, her garments are loosened, she's guilty, there's nothing she can say, she's looking scared, knowing the death coming her way, she sees the rocks in their hands, they must inflict the punishment, but listen, there's a new thing in the earth, a new thing in the earth, there he sits, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, those ten men lined up there represent Moses, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, and there he sits, between the law and the guilty woman to give life instead of death. In the decades to come, pastors around the world would see their local congregations grow and thrive as a result of radio ministry. Early pioneers like Paul Rader were paving the way for the church to reach the world through new technology. Another pioneer in radio was a woman named Amy Semple McPherson. In 1922, she became the first woman to broadcast a sermon over the radio waves. Always an innovator, McPherson's Los Angeles church, known as Angeles Temple, launched the very first radio station that was owned and operated by a church. All across the city, listeners would crowd into tents 
to hear the service broadcast from Angelus Temple. In the years that followed, Christian radio broadcast became a competitive field as denominations vied for free radio airwaves allotted by the government. Some ministers were forced to purchase time from the mainstream networks. One such minister was Charles Fuller. His Revival Hour radio show expanded from regional to national over the course of a decade, reaching 10 million weekly listeners by 1939. With the massive success of this gospel-centered program, Fuller's broadcast went global, reaching 20 million listeners a week in 1940. By 1940, any radio naysayers had long been silenced. Radio's ability to expand the gospel's reach and fulfill the Great Commission was being embraced by ministries around the world, and it modeled strategies for growth when other new technologies would emerge. Television, internet, social media, each of these new innovations have signaled new methods for sharing the hope and light of Christ with the world. New technologies have the potential to change all of our lives, and they already have. With each new innovation, both individuals and organizations are empowered to reach and connect with more people. This is a double-edged sword. We all have our praises for new technologies as well as our hesitations. New beginnings can be exciting, but they can also be a little scary. Whether it's a new law, new land, or a new gadget, the new represents the unknown possibilities, the room for change. That's why it's so important that we discern the times and seasons. God never changes, and He's not bound to our timeline of history. What's new and unknown to us is never unknown to Him. So we don't have to look to the future with fear. We can take joy in knowing that God even knows the end of our new beginnings. I hope you've enjoyed looking back at what happened this month in Christian history. What I love about studying the past is that one moment in time can open up loads of incredible history. No matter how much life we've lived, we can all learn so much from the believers that have gone before us. The peaks and valleys that they endured can prepare us to pioneer our own paths. But most of all, they can inspire us to trust in the God who holds all of history in his hands. I'm Cody Crouch. I hope you'll join me next time on This Month in Christian History. Until then, go make some history of your own.